Good morning, History 104. This is Dr. Redding again, and i um, like to introduce you to Ellie Gettinger from the Jewish Museum in Milwaukee, and she is an expert on many of the questions you've been posting in the discussion forums. So she and I decided perhaps she could tackle some of those questions in this format for you all. So good morning, Ellie. Good morning, Kimberly. Good morning, Dr. Redding. I'm so excited to be here. Um, as we were both talking about, it's really nice to just interact with another person <laughs> outside your family. Much as we love our families, yes. <laughs> we love our families, but we like to talk to other people too. All right. Can you um, say maybe just a little bit about how you got into this line of work? Sure. I um, went to school. My major was. Um, Jewish studies and history, and my focus has always been kind of, kind of more the modern Jewish world, Judaism post enlightenment, um, and what that looks like. Um, I moved to Milwaukee to take a different job in the Jewish community, and when Jewish Museum Milwaukee was opening in 2007, actually it was a year before it opened, I came on board as their education point person, and at that time I had no museum experience, but what I did bring was the sense of connections and connectivity in Jewish history, and then also a sense of outreach and engagement, which had been my previous job. Um, and I'd love to say, you know, I feel like I've really grown in this position. For all of you guys who are thinking about any form of work, any project you can come in on, in on the ground floor and build, it's a tremendous sense of satisfaction and seeing, you know, how people respond to it and how it changes and grows over time. It, it, the museum is my first child. <laughs> Super. Thank you. Um, so I, what I kind of have done is clustered some of the questions from the discussion forum into, uh, I think, maybe four or five different categories. And the first category was this question of Jewish identity and what counts as Jewish and why the Nazis chose that population to target um, those kinds of questions. Probably a very huge massive answer. <laughs> you know, yes, there are whole books and college level courses on this particular question of Jewish identity. Um, within the Jewish community, this is a contentious question. This is not a question that it's like there is one pat answer. Historically and religiously, it, you were considered Jewish if your mother was Jewish, which meant that you had, if you had, um, and if you think about this from a thousand years back, it's not always easy to identify who a father is, but you can always tell who someone's mother is, you know, and that, that's a way of really understanding. So Judaism was matrilineal. Um, in the 1980s, the reform movement, which is kind of the most liberal of the organized Jewish um, movements in the United States, actually internationally, made a decision at their convention to say, that you were Jewish if either your mother or your father was Jewish. They made it a patrilineal question. Mm -hmm. Within other branches of Judaism, that patrilineal descent isn't recognized in the same way, which means that there's some people who identify as Jewish who aren't always recognized by the entire Jewish community. This is why this is an incredibly complex question. Um, for the purposes of the museum, we tend to go with you're Jewish if you say you're Jewish. Um, and because we don't, we are not the arbiters, we're not part of a religious movement um, in any of those cases. For Hitler's definition, and this is one of those things that's incredibly complex, he made a definition that you're Jewish if one of your four grandparents are Jewish. Um, and if you think about that, what I just said to you, that means that if it's not your maternal grandmother, that you might not have been identified by the Jewish community as Jewish, and you might not have been identified personally as Jewish. Um, think about how closely tied you are to your grandparents and their identities. If you don't understand, if you're not close with your grandparents and you don't understand, well, one of my four grandparents are Jewish, there is a good chance that you don't actually, you, you, you might not have even known that you had this Jewish ancestry. Right. It might have been the sort of thing that a grandparent would have covered up as well. You know, if they converted, they didn't want people to know that they were Jewish. There was a stigma there, potentially. So there, this was the sort of thing that there were records and people were using these records and they were documenting 
this kind of you're Jewish if you have one Jewish grandparent really is only um, taken on as the definitional piece in Germany and in the pre-1939, once they move into Poland and, you know, and to Russia and all of these other places, they, they can't go into like that. They don't have the time to get into the ancestry, but it's really within Germany, Austria, Czechoslovakia, those tend to be the places where you see these kinds of definitions coming in. Um, and it's complicated. Our exhibit <laughs> next year has this amazing, um, for the spring, we always do a Holocaust exhibit. Right. And this exhibit is called The Pain is to Live, and it's an artist who is in Theresen. And one of the pieces that he re reflects, it's fascinating, it's, uh, it says, it's a piece he did while he was in Theresen, it says, here come the Christians. And it's about these people who have one out of four uh, Jewish grandparents who consider themselves Christian. And it's in a piece wow. that I don't know more about, that I don't know as much as I should. So that's coming up next spring? Next spring, yeah. Okay, awesome. I think that's the same time that the Traveling History Unfolded exhibit is at the Milwaukee Public Library. Oh, nice. So maybe I can maybe arrange a can joint field trip. <laughs> yeah, tag team field trip. Well, thank you for, for unpacking a little bit of really oh, nice question. Sorry, went on. <laughs> yeah, um, there was another really... Um, Vivid, powerful exchange on the discussion forums about the kinder transport mm -hmm. and how those children got out, um, how their parents made that decision, why it ended. Do we know anything about any of those kids after the war? And did they stay Jewish? Were they something else? Yeah. There's no again, like I'd love to see <laughs> 10,000 kids. Um, and I will say the majority of them stayed Jewish or maintained some sort of Jewish identity. Uh, the majority of them are orphans after the war mm -hmm. uh, because their parents aren't able to get out or escape. Um, and there are some relatively, you know, actually maybe in less, she doesn't go to England, but in a similar program, Dr. Ruth actually ends up in Switzerland. Wow. Um, <laughs> Me, Dr. Ruth. Me, Dr. Ruth. There is a fabulous if you guys are looking for media a fabulous do uh, documentary about her life it's called ask dr ruth and huh. it is amazing because this woman literally has done everything known to man um but one of the things that i was surprised by is that she when she's like 13 years old is sent away from her parents her parents make this very challenging decision that they're going to send their only child to switzerland and for the first couple of years I think that she's gone she receives letters and then nothing from them and her parents both die in the Holocaust. Um, I spoiled the movie for you I'm sorry. Um, there's more there's more and there's a lot of sex. Um, but the, most of these people for a while have some sort of content with con some sort of connection with their parents and then once World War II starts that is cut off and many of them have both if not one, at least one parent who dies. Most aren't able to get out. Many choose to stay in England after the war where they build lives for themselves. And um, some move to other places. There are a couple of people who are on kinder transport that come to Milwaukee. Um, one of them actually famously from a Milwaukee standpoint is a guy named Alfred Bader. So if you ever see anything oh, that's funded by yeah. the Bader Foundation, Alfred Bader was on kinder transport, ends up in England, comes to Canada after the war, and is trained there, and ends up setting up a chemical company in Milwaukee. Um, some really fascinating local stories as well. I think it is one of these things that parents, um, when faced with this decision, they're thinking, well, I'm going to send this kid, my kid away, but they don't, and, and it's an incredible amount of forethought, because right. Most people at this time were thinking, well, things are bad, but how can it get worse than this? You know, what could be worse than what's currently happening? And they're saying, I don't know what could be worse than what's currently happening, but I need my kid to get to somewhere safe. Right. And I think there's all sorts of con contemporary political connections with that as well, as you see people who try to get their kids to safe places all the time, in unsafe ways. But this is very similar. This is, this is a 
universal parental feeling. What do I do to make my child safe? Well, if it means being separated from them, this is what I'm going to do. Right. Wow. Do you know why it was shut down, the program? Or was it not really a program? It was a program. It was a program. The yeah. end of the program, the program ends as World War II starts. Okay. can't get people out. We right. did uh, our exhibit, Stitching History from the Holocaust, we ended up tracking down the niece of the central people who were, who were in that. Uh, and she and her sister, their nieces, the, the designer and her husband, their nieces were on kinder transport. And they're on like the last train out of Czechoslovakia. And I think it's like October, 1939. And so- Okay that's really the end of the line. Once you're trying to get out of a war zone to a country that's fighting that war zone, you know, that there's not going to be. Yeah. Right. Um, and I think one of the big challenges is how many visas they had accessible, how many people like, it's, it's a major success that people were able to get out at all. But it also mm -hmm. is such a small number as compared to the massive numbers of people who needed to get out. Do you know if there was any Wisconsin connection to that? So were there Wisconsin families that were trying to get kids or people out? There um, were definitely um, Wisconsin people who were trying to get people to the United States. Yeah. Um, the Stitching History from the Holocaust exhibit that we created, it has, um, there are, we, we look at this one couple that is sending letters to their uh, cousin in Milwaukee. Mm -hmm. The cousin in Milwaukee is, um, is, is, is really well connected. He's an attorney. His father owns an apartment store. And despite all this, we know it takes three years to even get through the red tape of going through America's wow. immigration system. To, like get a, a case open for them. And then once they have that case open, they have um, then World War, then Pearl Harbor happens, and then immigration stops the U.S. But I think that's the thing that, in looking at any of these people who came, and there were people who were able to get here and had sponsors and had those sorts of things, that the red tape was incredibly high. Um, like you look at even somebody like Mark Chagall, who's able to uh -huh. get out of France. Um, the artist, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mark Chagall, the artist, he had to have. I think it's like $500 in cash on hand in order to get on, get into the United States. You had to have people who were going to say, this guy's not going to fall in the welfare of the country. You had to have an exit visa from a Nazi occupied place. You had to have a entrance visa from a new country, from the new place. And those two times had to match up. You couldn't like, so you could potentially have an exit visa, but it could expire before you could get an entrance visa or vice versa. Right. Oh. <laughs> <coughs> so all, and, and, and I think when we look at say the Wisconsin people who were able to come here, generally they had someone who was sponsoring them, someone who was super well-connected. Right. Right. <coughs> um, so there, there's a whole set of questions about prevention, about why haven't things changed. And I, I want to start that with um, a number of students said they'd learned some things about the Holocaust in school or in other courses prior to this, but never about the early beginnings. They feel like they're, they're taught there's like a switch that gets turned, you know, and all of a sudden, yeah. There's a power and everything changes. Right. And, and they were really struck that it seems like there was kind of this slow ramping up and slow shift in society. Right. Does the museum focus on that or do you know anything about that? I definitely know stuff about it. It's a hard thing to get to just because that period of political unrest in the 1920s, the Weimar period, is really, it, it's, you know, from a, we set it up, but I can't say that we do any great visual things on it. I'd love to see an exhibit about what that period looks like. And if you guys in your research find some sort of great traveling exhibit on the Weimar period and how you get to 1933 Germany, we'd love to bring that to Milwaukee. 
Um, what I would say about that period is there are all sorts of ways of responding to political and economic unrest. Uh, and there are all sorts of kinds of protective covers that people take. And one of those protective covers is to say, we're not to blame for this. Let's look for who is to blame for this and let's find, and using that kind of fear-based political rhetoric, that was incredibly powerful. It still is incredibly powerful. That, I mean, we see that today, I'm talking to Dr. Redding on election day. <laughs> And you see that really at play in this current election about who's voting, why we should vote, why we shouldn't vote, why it's important that the election should happen today, why we can't postpone. All of these things are at play at this moment. Um, so, I mean, I think fear is an incredible catalyst and it's an incredible uh, unifier that our politicians have used since the beginning of time and continue to use. And I think that in the case of the Nazi party, they were taking existing stereotypes, existing, um, existing uh, racism and anti-Semitism in their society, and they were building a movement around it. They were saying, wait, we know you guys might all harbor feelings like this back here. We're going to bring these feelings up here. Right, sort of legitimize them and yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you think this is a question that historians argue about all, you know, back and forth. Right. So you think it would have played out differently in a different time. So do you think, you know, how, was this? Well, I do you think you need on some level the perfect storm of right. World War One reparation, right. uh, economic collapse, and that right. feeling of isolation that comes after seeing the kind of havoc that, you know, industrial warfare can wreak in a way that, you know, war the century before could not. Like, I think that you need all of that in order to mm -hmm. get here. Could it have come later? Maybe. I mean, we can yeah. to have war crimes and things like that. I mean, we're not getting smarter in that way. And we continue to use propaganda and, uh, your based rhetoric to mobilize people to do things. So I don't know if it has to be solely at this time, but I think you need to have some sort of great cataclysmic event like World War One to get to this right. point in history. Some kind of crisis or set of crises. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Here's hoping we're not in the middle of something like that. Right. <laughs> and we're in doomsday scenarios all the time. Um, is there, so we watched your video walkthrough of the exhibit. Thank you very much for doing that. You're a good storyteller. I, I love telling stories. <laughs> for me, it was an incredibly, it was one of those things that I wanted to do. I have loved guiding that exhibit. And the minute it started to look like I was not going to get to do it anymore, I just needed, I needed that outlet. So for me, it was actually like, this is a personal thing that I need to do for me. And if this museum was fine, I need this. <laughs> so I think that in the exhibit, some, one of the students noted that there were a number of diaries that were found or that, that survived, I think, Auschwitz outside the crematorium. This is a bizarre story that I did not know about before this yeah. particular. And with one of the one of the reasons I love working in a museum, and I'm sure Kimberly, this is one of the reasons you love working in academia, is that academia, you're always learning something new. Right. There's <laughs> never a moment when you're like, this is it, I know everything. Right. Always, you're like, ah. And this was one of those new stories. So the Thunder Commando, who were the Swiss slave laborers in Auschwitz who were tasked with the horrible job of taking people from the gas chambers to the crematoria. Like they are the people responsible for handling all of the dead bodies. People, they probably didn't know, but they might have, and, mm -hmm. and moving them. But they started at some point their own act of resistance. Um, and they had actually taken on a physical act of resistance, but they, this is a mental act of resistance where they started documenting what they were doing and writing about it. And then as they were collecting things from the people who had been, uh, who had come to Auschwitz, you know, they're taking all of their possessions, 
they took manuscripts that they would find and they would put them outside of the crematoria at Auschwitz. And they, they stayed them, I think, until the end of the war as it was clear that Nazis were, they, they bombed the crematoria so that there wasn't evidence. They bombed the gas chamber so they didn't have that kind of evidence of what had happened there. But they, um, they in the rubble after the war, they put things there to say, this is what happened, this is what we witnessed, this is what we were a part of. And Rivka's diary, this diary was one of the key things. There are nine manuscripts that were found there. Right. And kind of this amazing, you know, but those who are passionate about history, can you imagine a more, like that? that is such an amazing act of resistance to say, we are here, we want to document what's happening to us, even at risk of our own lives and, and to preserve it. The diary itself, Rivka's diary is found by this Russian, the Soviet doctor, and she um, keeps it for 50 years without even knowing what's in it, and then sends it to her um, granddaughter, ends up getting it. I'm realizing that my husband is walking through with my daughter. <laughs> Everyone, you just got to see, you've seen all sorts of things in the mirror, but <laughs> clearly there's some sort of screen thing that's happening right now, sorry. Um, so, the, her granddaughter ends up getting it translated, but it's not until 2008. So it's an incredibly, like, I think that's the thing that if someone recognized the important work of this document without even knowing what it was. What it was, yeah. Um, and, and saving it and preserving it and making sure that her family understood that this was important too. Um, I think as we get further and further from the Holocaust, this is one of the things that we have to really think about. How are we telling these stories? How are we sharing personal insights and being able to use diaries and writing as a way of connecting with individuals in the Holocaust is certainly one of those kind of fundamental pieces that we need to be exploring um, as we're 75 years after the liberation of so is the whole diary translated in English someplace? If somebody wanted to, yeah. Um, we so the, I will. I think you can get copies on Kindle. Okay. Um, we have copies for sale in the museum, cut off from all of the universe. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's out of print, in but they're working on getting it reprinted, um, and. I think there's uh, like I certainly can send you. I have excerpts from a bunch of the a bunch of the diary, but not the whole thing. But it is all translated. Okay. And it just kind of starts and stops. It starts without an introduction. There are many of you in high school or middle school read Diary of Anne Frank, and that has like a real legit. You know, she's like, "This is why I'm writing this. This is why I got this. This is why I'm calling you Kitty. Why you're going to be my friend." Nothing like that. And then it ends just dot, dot, dot in the middle of the line. Uh, in fact, yeah. here's the last line. I'll, I'll, I have it right here. <laughs> My very well book, you know, bookmarked copy of Rifka's Diary. The last line, which actually is Wednesday, April 12th, 1944. So we're not going to Why? She says, um, first, Mrs. Hanya from the office informed us that those born in 1926, 27 could work for 10 hours and have laying. They're going to get an extra ration, but they would need a document from registration department stating their birth, date of birth. I'm afraid nobody will apply. For now, I'm glad about this turn of events because I was born in 1927. That actually, dot, dot, dot. She wasn't actually born in 1927. She was born in 1929. So I think she's writing it here in the hopes that maybe she can start convincing people that she was born two years earlier to get the extra ration that she might need. Wow. This is four months before she's deported, but she stops writing for some reason. Hmm. We don't know. Maybe it's hunger, maybe it's inability to get, to have time, who knows. But it, the document is important enough to her that she takes it with her when she is deported to Auschwitz. Hmm. Thank you. Emotional. Is there anything else you want to say about the exhibit or about um, or anything? Just sort of a free. <laughs> I think for me, one of the things, and I hope this came through in the video, is that 
for us, we don't know exactly what happens to Rivka. And I think that's one of the things we don't know with our stitching history from the Holocaust, the dress design exhibit, we don't know exactly what happened uh, to them. We know they both died. We're not entirely sure where. Mm -hmm. But sometimes we get really fixated as historians on this kind of method and manner of death. And for me, with Rivka's diary, with stitching history, it became more important to really reflect on how people lived and who they were. And I love that this gives us a way of exploring someone who probably didn't survive the Holocaust. A lot of times when we're talking about the getting that sense of who someone was, how they lived, the only way we can do that is through the survivors themselves and their stories about their lives. Right. So this is kind of a conduit to get into someone who probably didn't survive. We're not 100% sure, but to get a sense of her life and who she was. And, and I think that that's an important way of transmitting and understanding history as well. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Ellie. I really appreciate your taking the time. Thank you. This was a pleasure. And if any other questions come up, I'm, you know, I'm sitting around working from home. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you so much.